Big annotation is the language we use for talking about how long an algorithm takes to run. We can compare different functions or algorithms using big O and say which one is better than the other when it comes to scale, regardless of our computer differences. And we can measure big O like this. This may look really confusing at first if it's the first time you're seeing this diagram, but don't worry, by the end of this video, this all is going to make sense. When we talk about big O and scalability of code, we simply mean when we grow bigger and bigger with our data, how much does the algorithm slow down? As the list of elements in the input increases, how many more operations do we have to do? That's all it is. And big O allows us to explain this concept. Different functions have different big O complexities. That is, this number of operations can increase really fast, like this one, which is not good, we can see that it's in the red spectrum. And we also have things that are quite good actually, and don't increase as much, like these ones here. And we are going to look at examples of all types of complexities, and see how we can actually measure this, and what this entire notation means. But just remember this point, that when we talk about big O and scalability of code, we simply mean when we grow bigger and bigger with our input, how much does the algorithm slow down? The less it slows down, the better it is. So let's start by talking about time complexity. Imagine you're at a concert and you're trying to find your friend Bob in a crowd. One way you might do this is by going through each person in the crowd one by one and asking if he's Bob. This in big O terms would be O of n, where n is the number of people in the crowd. Because if Bob was the last person in the order, you would have to go through all of the people to find Bob. And the more people there are, the more time it takes to find Bob. This is known as linear time complexity. Now let's say you could clone yourself until there are as many of you as there are people in the crowd. You could then ask everyone at the same time if he's Bob. This scenario represents O of 1 or constant time complexity, because regardless of the crowd's size, it takes the same amount of time to find Bob. As you can see, different approaches result in different time complexities, and that's what big O notation helps us to quantify. Big O notation is a way to express how fast an algorithm is. You can think of it like speed limit of a function or algorithm. The smaller the big O, the faster the algorithm runs. Let's look at all types of time complexities that we have on this chart. Imagine you're in a room with a hundred boxes and your task is to find a specific item. Now think about how long it would take you to find that item if it were in the first box you checked versus if it were in the last box. That's essentially what we are dealing with here, best case versus worst case scenarios. First up, we have O of 1, also known as constant time complexity. This is ideal scenario where it takes the same amount of time to compute something, regardless of the input size. There are no loops involved here, no matter the size of our array, we are only interested in the first element. This operation will always take the same amount of time, hence O of 1. Next up, we have O of log n, or logarithmic time complexity. This is typically seen in searching algorithms. Imagine our room full of boxes again, but this time every step you take eliminates half of the remaining boxes. This means that you're efficiently zoning in on your target. On each step, we are reducing our problem size by half. Hence, it's a log n complexity. Next, we have O of n, also known as linear time complexity. This is like checking each box one by one until you find your item. It's pretty straightforward. As your input grows, the time it takes grows linearly. For every item in the array, we are performing an operation Hence, the time it takes scales linearly with the number of items. For more complex operations, we have O of n log n, or log linear time complexity. This is usually the case for sorting operations. It's like sorting our items in a certain order before finding the specific item. For example, merge sort that we have here. 
This is a merge sort algorithm. It divides the problem down and then merges the solutions, resulting in an n log n complexity. Next, we have O of n squared or quadratic time complexity. This is seen when every element in a set needs to be compared to every other element. Think of it like this. For every box in our room, you have to open it and compare it with every other box. Here, for each element in the array, we are looping through the entire array again. This usually happens when you have two nested for loops, which gives us an n squared operations. And lastly, we have exponential time complexity and factorial time complexity. These are at the higher end of our complexity spectrum, often seen with recursive algorithms or when adding loop for every element. For example, this function recursively calculates the Fibonacci sequence, but it does it so inefficiently by recalculating lower numbers multiple times, which leads us to a lot of extra calculations, hence the exponential time complexity. And this other function generates all permutations of an array, for each element, it swaps it with the next element and then recurses for the remaining elements. That's why it has factorial time complexity. Now let's discuss what could cause time in a function. This could be the result of operations like addition or subtraction, comparisons like greater than or less than, looping constructs like for or while, and calling outside functions. It's important to remember a few rules when dealing with big O notation. The first one is that you always have to consider the worst case scenario. Next, you have to remove constants. We are more interested in how our algorithm grows instead of the precise details. Next, for different inputs, you should have different variables. So if you have two different inputs, we'd express it as O of A plus B or O of A times B instead of O of N. And lastly, you have to drop non-dominant terms, which means that when considering complexity, we focus on the parts that have the most impacts. For example, if you have O of n squared plus n, you need to drop the end and say that it's O of n squared complexity. Now let's talk about the space complexity. When a program executes, it has two ways to remember things. The heap and the stack. The heap is usually where we store variables that we assign values for, and the stack is where we keep track of our function calls. Sometimes we want to optimize for using less memory instead of using less time. Talking about memory or space complexity is very similar to talking about time complexity. We simply look at the total size relative to the size of the input and see how many new variables or new memory we are allocating. We also have to consider how much input our function can take. For example, if we are using a ton of space when running our function, the memory might overflow. And by the way, things like stack overflow is something related to this. Here are some factors that contribute to space complexity. First, we have variables. The size and number of variables can impact the space complexity. For example, if you have an array with n elements, it will require n units of memory to store all the values, and it will be O of n space complexity. Data structures like arrays, linked lists, trees, or hash tables can also affect space complexity. The size and complexity of these data structures determine how much memory they consume. For instance, a binary tree with n nodes will require O of n space complexity. Next, we have function calls. When we call a function, memory needs to be allocated for its execution. This includes storing function arguments, local variables, and return addresses. Most of the times, recursive functions can take a lot of space complexity. And lastly, we have allocations. Dynamic memory allocations, such as creating objects or arrays dynamically using keywords like new, they also contribute to space complexity. And remember, when analyzing space complexity, we follow similar principles as with the time complexity. We always consider the worst case scenario. We remove constants and focus on the overall trend. For different inputs, we should have different variables in the complexity expression. And we drop non-dominant terms to focus on the main contributors to space complexity. I hope this chart now makes more sense to you and it was easy to follow. 
Thanks for watching and see you next time.